This is a film about a village in Ashanti. Ashanti is part of the Gold Coast, one of the British colonies in West Africa. The country is mostly jungle and forest. It's only a few degrees north of the equator, and in the humid tropical atmosphere, giant trees, bushes, creepers and plants flourish all the year round. There are hundreds of little villages scattered throughout the great forests. Little villages where the trees and the dense undergrowth have been cleared away. Little villages linked together by footpaths and tracks, but linked to the towns by fine, straight highways. This village is called Inkawi, and it's market day here. People have been arriving since daybreak. Some come by lorry or bus or bicycle, but most people walk, carrying their wares on their head. And the mothers carry their babies in a sort of sling on their back. They come from outlying farms and from other villages, mostly to sell as well as to buy. You can buy or sell almost anything at the market. There's food such as plantains, cassava and rice. There's fruit and spices. There are goats and chickens and smoked fish, which has come from villages on the coast. And there are all kinds of things for the house. Pots and pans, jugs and basins, besides clothes and cloths and hats and ribbons. Market day is the most popular day in any village because it gives people a chance to meet, talk, and laugh. At the far end of the village is the school. Like many others in Ashanti, it was founded by missionaries many years ago, but now it's assisted by the government and run largely by the village chief and his elders. Education is not compulsory on the Gold Coast, nor is it free. But all the same, roughly one child in every four now goes to school from about the age of five to 15. They have very much the same kind of lessons and the same kind of games as the children in British schools. The cocoa harvest is now ready, and the farmers and their families set off into the bush where the cocoa trees planted in small clearings are shaded from too much sunshine by the towering trees of the jungle. It's a busy time for everybody when the harvest comes round, and there are two harvests a year, the main one in November and a small one in May. The cocoa pod is something like a small melon in size. It grows straight out from trunk or branch and it turns from light green to golden yellow when it's fully ripe. The average tree yields about 25 pods. That's roughly enough to produce a one pound tin of cocoa. The 
pods are cracked and opened by the men, and the beans are scooped out by the women and children. Usually, there's about 40 beans to a pod, and they're covered with a white, juicy pulp. Now the beans have to be matured, or fermented as it's called, and this is done with the aid of broad green plantain leaves. A patch of ground is cleared in the shade, and the leaves cut from the soft stem of the plantain tree are spread out in readiness. Meanwhile, the work of gathering and cutting open the pods goes on steadily. The first basketfuls of white, glistening beans are carried to the fermenting bed. When they're all heaped up, the pile will be covered over with more plantain leaves and left for five or six days until the juice and pulp have disappeared. Back in the village, let's visit the farmer's house, the compound where he and his large family live. His wife is preparing food. She's making what's called fufu, a sweet, stodgy paste of cassava or plantain which will later be fried in oil. Those children who are not helping in the harvesting have their own jobs to do, such as peeling plantains for the stew pot and keeping the kitchen fire alight. two youngsters have managed to find time for a game of worry. Along with Ludo and Drafts, it's a very popular pastime for grown-ups as well as children. And now the cocoa beans have matured. 
They've been brought to the village from their bed of plantain leaves in the forest clearing and spread out on long tables to dry. For five or six days, farmers and their families will be busy turning over their crops so that the scorching sun shall dry them thoroughly. Final check by the farmer and his head man, and the beans are ready to be sold, not in the village market, but to brokers and buyers who have offices and storerooms in many of the larger villages. The harvest is packed into clean new sacks and carried off to the nearest Cadbury depot. African Clark is in charge of the depot. He knows most of the farmers in this district. They chat together while samples of the beans are taken from every sack. Then the crop is weighed. Sample beans are split open and put on a special tray so that their quality can be judged. The price paid to the farmer depends, of course, on the quality of his crop. And the more care he takes in maturing and drying the beans, the more money he'll get for his pains. All the cocoa nowadays is bought by the government, so that a steady price is given to the farmer and he's protected from the violent price changes which used to occur. Now by trucks or trains, the sacks go to the coast, to one of the ports to be shipped to England. Here, at the busy port of Accra, there is no deep water harbour, so the ocean-going vessels have to stand out at sea, a mile or so from the land. The sacks must therefore be loaded into small, sturdy boats, which take them out through the heavy Atlantic rollers and into the calmer, deeper seas. The Africans who man these surf boats are famous all over West Africa for their skill and for their great strength.
As each surf boat is emptied, the head man climbs aboard with an invoice on which must be written the number of sacks his crew have brought from the shore. At the end of the day, he and his men will be paid according to the amount of work they've done. long the surf boats ply back and forth from the beach to the cargo liners and more and more sacks are hoisted up and stored away in the holds ready for the long journey which may end in your home. 